Okay. Thank you. Have a good conversation, gentlemen. Thank you. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. And also once a month, I am the host and co-producer of the only broadcast, monthly broadcast in the world for fathers and men that's sponsored by Dove Men Care and also co-sponsored by Dad Central. But it's none of those tonight. It's Eminem Explores, our regular monthly, at least once a month conversation exploring men and masculinity that is powered by the men and masculinity team. In lieu of time, we'll mention them at the end, but I also want to welcome my great co-host, Mr. Robert Leung. Robert, what is up? Dr. Vibe, always great to be with you and welcome to everybody here tonight. Looking forward to a great conversation. Yes, absolutely. So let's get, let's get it. For Unless you have your head in the sand in North America, this is Black History Month. Yes, February, that one month, question mark, that is there to celebrate Blackness. So we thought it'd be a great idea to have some esteemed guests, esteemed black men, to chat about our conversation topic tonight. What's in the hearts and minds of today's black man during Black History Month 2021. So we are very blessed and highly favored to have them. I'm going to pass the mic, so to speak, for introductions first to Steve Anderson, and he'll introduce our other panelists. Welcome, Steve. Dr. Vibe, thank you. This is, uh, yeah. Privilege to be here. Appreciate your asking me on and, and the other men. This is, here we are. It's uh, Black History Month. Like you said, that one month <laughs> where we get to celebrate, but we're, we're Black every day. So, you know, this is, um, this is a great conversation to be having. So I really appreciate, appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm living in Toronto now. I'm originally from uh, Kentucky. I'm an Olympic uh, coach, Olympic gold medal coach in beach volleyball. And we started a group of men um, it originated in Buffalo, New York, uh, called the Black Diamond Circle. And so we've got some of those men who are going to be joining us tonight. And um, so I'd like to introduce the, the first uh, young man who's actually leading the group now. Um, the, uh, his name is Sir Amazing, uh, but his, his Christian name, uh, given name is uh, Aime McKinday. So Mr. McKinday, can you introduce yourself, sir? Yes, I can. Thank you, sir. And, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this conversation. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. Uh, as Mr. Anderson said, my name is Amy McKinney Jr., a.k.a. Sir Amazing. I am a best-selling author and uh, someone who definitely has done a lot of work in regards to healthy masculinity, along with the group that uh, Anderson and myself are a part of. I did a project with New York State Department of Health and Cornell University that focused on healthy masculinity for sixth to eighth grade boys in the Buffalo, New York area. Um, so I'm very well invested. And, and like Mr. Anderson said, um, I'm pretty sure March 1st, I'm still gonna be black. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, don't make assumptions. You never know, you know. <laughs> so far it's worked out, so. <laughs> good, good, good. Great it's to be here. Good. Who Who are we hearing from next? So next young man who's part of the Black Diamond Circle, uh, Mr. Dominique. So uh, Harlan Dominique, Mr. Sir, can you introduce yourself? Hey guys, how's it going? Good evening. Um, Harlan Dominique, I'm originally from uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, lived in Buffalo, uh, Buffalo, went to Buffalo State College, lived out in Buffalo about 10 years, just recently moved back in the New York City region. Um, I am the founder of Meacham Media, Media and Marketing Production. Um, so. It's funny that you guys say, uh, stated about Black, Black History Month. Um, if you guys know the story about Atra Meacham, he's actually the very first uh, African-American who started a production company. So I named my production company after him because uh, he opened the gates in regards to Black Hollywood. So without him, wouldn't be no Tyler Perry, wouldn't be any Spike Lee, um, and so on and so on. Um, and when it comes to the topic of Black, I'm Black as it is, man. And just like, <laughs> just like what Kelly said, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure, but in March, I was, I'm still going to look like this. And I don't bleach. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks for being here. Steve, who do we have up next? Yeah, so uh, that's it with our team. We, we have another young man who may be joining us a little bit later, uh, LeVan okay. Stotson. Um, that's for team. But I see some other men here on the call. I'm really interested to get to know, uh, know better. So Dr. Vibe, you're going to have to introduce these men. Well, I, 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 you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the conversation, 
Okay. And uh, and if anyone wants to join in, because uh, I want to make this a, a group conversation. So when I share this topic to you, Black men, what is in your hearts and minds, February 24th, 2021? Talk to me. Talk to myself. Talk to Robert. What's in your hearts and minds as a Black so, man? <clears throat> I'm gonna jump in here first, man. I've been waiting for this conversation. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump in here. So the reason why I made the, the comment about, um, you know, February and Black History Month, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to shortchange it at all. The fact that it's, that it's recognized is, um, that is a positive thing. Um, and, you know, what I said before about being Black after February, that's what's going on. It's, this is, um, you know, we're all living the, I'm in Canada right now. Um, most of the team members are in the States, whether it's Atlanta or, or New York. We have some other members in Canada. And, you know, it's the same thing. So some of the challenges that are being held in, in the U.S. right now, we still have some of those same challenges um, here in Canada. And so what came up for me was this is a great conversation so people can actually get an insight in what it's like to be Black in, in North America, a Black man in these days and times. Um, yeah, and it's, it's an interesting time with the politics, you know, the politics from down south, they bleed up north as well. The conversations here, you know, it affects the economy. We've got COVID going on now, um, you know, it's disproportionately with, with people of color, uh, people who, um, you know, low income, um, you know, people losing their jobs. It's, uh, it's an interesting time to be a, a person of color right now. And the thing about these young men who, I keep calling them young men because I'm 56, but um, each one of these young men, not only are they trying to better themselves, not only are they working on bettering themselves, but they're making a contribution to the community. That's the thing that pulls everybody together is this contribution that they want to make uh, to the community. And young men doing this, that lights me up. Men in their 20s and 30s who are making a contribution into the community instead of you know just thinking really about their own lives, that really gets me far. I got a 12 year old and these are the men who are paving the way for him. So that's, uh, it really gets me lit up. Sure. So, so amazing, talk to me. What's on my mind on this particular date is Trayvon Martin. There have been so many different cases, situations, stories throughout the history of the black man in America. But I just remember in 2012, I was 19 years old. I'm 6'2". Trayvon Martin was 6'1", I believe, 6'3"-ish around there. He was 17. And I just remember thinking, like, that could easily have been me. That could easily have been me visiting my dad in the South, going to get in Arizona. And in two days, it'll mark his, uh, he, he was murdered February 26, 2012. And I just think about appreciating that I'm still here and understanding that when I watch a movie like Just Mercy or hear about the situation that happened in Rochester where a man was naked on camera, forced to the ground by police officers, and there were no charges just announced today, no charges against those police officers. It, uh, it cuts deep. Um, but it also motivates me to to do what Anderson shared as far as constantly working on self to see how I can serve and, and doing everything in my power to remind people of what connects us all. And that is the blood that runs through all of our veins, that is blood, um, the skin that is red, no matter where we're from. Um, and the fact that I got a little bit more melanin, it's really... Uh, <laughs> It's just a cool advantage to have in this in this uh, game of life. Thank you. Oh. Who wants to jump in? Don't I'll be shy. You're I'll black men. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'll say something. Uh, for me, when I think of this month, um, what goes in my head right now and is reflection. All right, um, reflection is in regards to the reflection of a, of reality. Right, so I appreciate the fact that we do, like McKinley said, I do appreciate the fact that we do have a month that we celebrate Black History. Um, but I, 
I understand the history of it, but there's no solution to fixing that history. Um, and a fortunate, sad thing about it, most of the stuff that happened 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago are still occurring today. Um, just like McKinley said, like the situation in Rochester, New York, I've been following it, the news all day. Um, it's, it's horrific, you know, an African-American man who was clearly need, who needed some help and was treated like an animal and he lost his life, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of emotion, a lot of, you know, of course, anger, sorrow, pain. Um, but like I said, it's just a reflection of reality. Thank you. Wayne? Yeah, thanks for sharing, guys. Uh, getting the American perspective is always very interesting to me. I, I know I know my American history to a degree. You know, I know about Black Wall Street and Tulsa and Greenwood and all the different things that we see through your media, which permeates across the border. It doesn't stop at Buffalo. It jumps right across into Niagara and into Toronto. So we know you. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know us, which is, which is, which is very, very, very interesting because someone in Buffalo is like, I'll, I'll put it in miles for you. You're, you're less than 100 miles away from where I live, but we're thousands of miles apart in terms of our knowledge of each other. But millimeters apart in our experience yeah. with with colonialism imperialism and racism so i think one of the things that black history bears and brings to me as a black man is first of all defining myself as a man and not just a male and there's a difference between being a male and being a man and i think that's the first hurdle that men have to admit to. You see a lot of males getting getting publicity and media and they talk about them in the tabloids. These are males doing male things. It just happened to look like me because of my gift of melanin. So when someone says you fit the description, Harlan, you said, you, oh no, I think it was Sir Amazing said he's 6'2". I'm 6'2". Right? Now, 6'2", a facial hair, 6'2", a facial hair. Harlan, how tall are you? If I'm not in a half, a good day. <laughs> oh, but I was there. I was there, but I kept, I kept going. <laughs> I kept going. So what I'm saying is we have shared experience, shared history. The boat that got off at South Carolina could have gotten off in Brazil, could have got off in the Caribbean, could have got off in Canada. It's luck of the draw, but what I like to remind myself of in Black History Month as a black man is that there was 90% attrition on those boats coming across from Africa. Nine, zero. 12 million dead. If you're here, you're one of the thousand points of light that's supposed to do more than just survive during your brief time on this planet. Your job my job, I will not speak for anyone else. My job is to put myself in position every month of every year, of every week, of every day to put myself in position to do something, something, anything to level up and help other people like me level up. And that's, that's how I approach it. Who I am in 2021 Dr. Vibe can attest to is not who I was in 2011, is not who I was in 2001, is not who I was in 1991. And when you meet people from those those days who meet you today, they should say, I don't recognize you. Because if they do recognize you, that means you haven't grown. So I'm about growth. So I'm on this call tonight to declare to people I, I haven't met and I love what I'm hearing about what you guys are doing in the community. I'm looking for best practices and systems to not reinvent the wheel. Steve, if you have the answer on what it takes to get something done with teenage boys or younger boys or young men over the age of 18 and under the age of 30, you've cracked the code, you've got the blueprint, you've got the McDonald's Big Mac secret. I'd like to know that secret so I don't have to waste time. It's the only non-renewable resource we have. I don't wanna waste time trying to reinvent the wheel. I'd rather pay you for your intellectual property and have a program that I can stand up in 2021 and execute on rather than trying to reinvent the wheel in every pocket where we exist. 
Well, let's talk oh, about that. Let's just go any, <laughs> before we go any further. I have been blessed to know Mr. Wayne Harris for a long time. So uh, any conversation I'm in with, with him has always made me better. And I'm complete with that. Robert, or does anyone else have any comments? Or Robert, do you want to come on in? I, you know, I, I'm, I've been sitting here listening to everybody's conversation. I'm very interested. I, I had a, a, a personal um, issue that I, I wanted to put on the table, but I don't want to sidetrack the conversation. Bring it, bring it, bring it. We're having a conversation. Come on. <laughs> well, my background is my mother was black and my father was Chinese. And I've lived most of my life um, in, I'd like to say sort of a, a limbo space of not adopting any particular ethnic background. I grew up in a neighborhood that was Irish Italian and we were the, the only family of color in the neighborhood at the time. Eventually that, that changed, but for a long time, um, I had the sense of just sort of fitting in there weren't any Chinese people there either. So there were two different uh, ethnic groups, neither one of which was a part of the, the neighborhood that I grew up in. And um, because I don't necessarily look particularly black, I just, my parents said, well, just fit in. So I'm from a, ge a generation that was fitting in. And, but for, for a majority of my life, it was like, well, okay, what, what do you identify with? And I was just interested to get some of you gentlemen's perspective on that, which is, again, I don't want to sidetrack the conversation, but in, in some way that was the issue that came up for me. Um, anyone, so I, want to, anyone want to touch that? I'll jump in on that, man. That's, um, so I'm 56, be 57 this year, Robert, and grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. And, um, you know, it was it was an interesting thing growing up in Kentucky at that time. It was lot lots of life experiences. I don't want to go through them all, um, but there was a there was this mindset of trying to fit in. Um, and you know, the neighborhood I came from was a pretty rough neighborhood. If you if you studied too much or you spoke a certain way, you were trying to be white. You know, it's just a, a stigma. It's all sorts of you know. Um, I find it interesting, the, the system that I grew up in was set up not for me. And people talk about the system being broken. The system is not broken. It's functioning the way that it was set up. It was just set up for a specific group of people. And now it's, it's irrelevant because it's, we, we wanted to serve everyone. So we actually need a new system. But growing up in that system, how could I not have some self-hate? How could I not have some intern um, bias and racism towards self? How could I not be a racist myself? Which I didn't know until I moved out to California and they told me the Ku Klux Klan doesn't march on Martin Luther King's birthday out here down the street in full dress. I thought that was a normal thing growing up in Kentucky in the 60s and 70s. That's my part of my mentality. I'm thinking that's normal. So just growing up in the system that we're in, you know, what is the identity? When I was growing up, Caucasian male was the model for success. And it was promoted that way. And if you wanted to make it in corporate America, you had to try to fit in. Now, the interesting thing about that is I know many black men who were made themselves very successful, spoke the same way they spoke in the neighborhood, you know, they, they may have dressed in a professional manner because they were, you know, working professional capacity, but they were authentic. And it confused me. It absolutely confused me because what I saw in media, what, you know, the messages that I was receiving was I couldn't be my authentic self and make it in corporate America. But luckily I had models that showed me that that was absolutely false. And now you see young men could be tatted up, you know, come from whatever background, you know, in a, in a business meeting with Warren Buffett or, you know, Jay-Z sitting down with Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett's talking about how much he respects and appreciates Jay-Z as a business person, you know? So that's, those, at, at, in that time, I think it was, you know, who could grow up in those times and not be confronted with 
uh, going one way or the other. And one of those ways is be conflicted about, well, how should I present myself to the world? You know, you know, it's not sustainable though, if you betray yourself. So <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the only problem. And I'm interested to hear from you, you know, where are you at and how did you uh, come to terms with that? Because I didn't know that your mother was black then. So yeah, that's, uh, how did you, how did you do that dance? I mean, I, I think it took a while. I think um, I've been involved with the men's work, I've been on a men's team for 30 years. And I think the process of just accepting the fact that, okay, what I am is I'm half black and half Asian, and that's who I am. And I, I don't have to identify with one side or the other. I can identify with both and created my own identity out of that. But it took some time and some energy and some experience to um, to get there, because um, in some ways, I felt like not accepted by either community for a time. And um, there were people who said, "Well, if you've got one ounce of black blood in you, you're black, and that's the way it is." And and there were everybody had an opinion, so I had to create my own, which is just a, just accept the benefits and the beauty of both sides of that equation, and be able to identify that that way but initially you know it was it, as you said it was confusing because my parents were just trying to say just stay under the radar and you know if anybody asks you just tell them you're american was one of the things they actually said but um it was a uh, it was a, a confusing and, and i got what happens i got into a lot of fights and um you know people would ask me i'd say that you know i'm american they say that's not a, a race and then i'd say well fuck you and then basically off we'd go so, you know, in some ways it made me better at taking care of myself in, in some way, but in a particularly distinct way, I wasn't taking care of myself. There was no answer that fit until I got old enough to create my own answer and create my own level of comfort and power within who I was and be okay with that. And this is actually the first time I've actually brought up this conversation. And I felt this was a form that I, for some reason that I felt I could trust and, um, and, and actually trust myself actually to have this kind of open dialogue about it. So I appreciate your, your open and honest feedback and input. Thank you. Um, one of the things that Steve mentioned, oh, Harlan, go ahead. You had something to say, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question for Robert. Um, and if you feel comfortable, you can answer. What type of trauma did, did I bring, you know, not being accepted by the two ethnic groups? Well, I think for a long time, it created a, a definite inferiority complex and the sense that I had to prove myself and be better than. Um, so in some ways it worked for me, but the, the other side of it was there was, a, it was definite insecurity. You know, um, I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere for a long time. And, um, and that, was, that was definitely uncomfortable and difficult to, to live that way. So I tried not to talk about what I was, even to myself, I guess, in some way. I just want to build on what Robert's saying uh, for the men that are on the call here who are Black. Are you always feeling that you have to prove yourself? Is that a continuous battle you have to face? As a Black man? I believe so. Can you expand? Uh, I think in regards to our community, especially when you're educated, um, I can speak for myself. So I um, grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, Flatbush, um, 50s to be exact. Um, if you're familiar with Brooklyn and you're familiar with that area, uh, a lot of West Indians, you know, pretty rough. Um, and you're supposed to pretty much walk in a certain beat to a drum, right? Um, when you go away from school, of course, you're op your mind is open you're, you experience different things. And I think, uh, and Anderson actually touched on this point um, where you might come off, I guess, to them white. So when you come back to the neighborhood, to them, it's like you, you have no stripes anymore. <laughs> you're not one of us. So it's like, you gotta kind of wear like different masses, right? Or, or have different type of toning or different type of dialects, dialect just to communicate with them. So like how I'm talking to you guys, this, this is typically how I talk now, but if I, I mean, I, I would say early on, 
I would try to kind of fit to like try to pretty much take 10 steps back to what I used to be when I realized I can't, I, I have to be authentic. Um, so yeah, you kind of, you constantly got to prove yourself within your community. And of course, when you're, you're outside your community, you have to constantly prove to them that you're worthy, right? Now I'm a black man, I'm five nine, I'm 207 pounds, stocky, I have locks. Uh, I look exotic to a Caucasian person, right? And there's times, and I'm an entrepreneur, so there's times I could, I'll, I'll literally walk into a room and I could be in a room with millionaires and whatnot, and automatically they're assuming that I'm less intelligent, I can't articulate, and <laughs> I have to actually prove myself to them that I understand, that I know what I'm talking about. And they typically get surprised as far as, okay, oh, wow, you're, you're pretty smart. I had one guy one time, I'll never forget this. I had one time that I was talking about whatever we were doing at the time. We was working on a project and we was trying to collab with someone. And uh, the man said, the man said, uh, wow, you're really smart. Didn't know that. And I wanted to say like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, what, what do you mean by that? Like, you're really smart. You, you thought I was dumb? So yeah, so yeah, just to touch on your point, you, you constantly got to prove yourself in, in, in different areas, especially in America. I like yeah, that. I'd like to jump in on this too, man. I'm a, you hitting all my buttons tonight, Dr. Vibe. Well, but you know, but Sir, <laughs> Sir Amazing first, I think we go oh, Sir yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Steve, <laughs> Sir Amazing, on. Steve and Wayne. Man, it, it's, there's so many points that have been hit on. Um, when it comes to the identity point, for me, I am African American. My dad is African. My mom is Black American. My parents got divorced when I was young. I grew up as a Black American man. And I had a conversation with my dad where I'm like, I felt like Killmonger because when I came to visit, there were people in the Congolese community that looked at me different because I didn't speak the language, because I was American, like I was less than. Like that's the energy that I received and then at the same time i was i felt isolated from black community because well he's african he looks at things differently like i always said like i live in atlanta now but growing up in buffalo there was times where if i went down one side of main street towards the city dressed a certain way i like to tuck my shirt and that's just kind of guy i am I, I think a polo looks better tucked in and untucked mm -hmm. they looking at me funny when i'm going to the gas station if I go down the other side of Main Street, which is more of the suburbs, they looking at me funny when I walk in just the same exact way. So uh, it's uh, it's just an interesting dynamic to not feel comfortable in your own skin. And I, I always felt like that growing up and especially in adulthood where I grew and got more a few more muscles and things like that. It was like everywhere I walk, somebody's looking at me. So it's, it's, I could look at a, another black man. And he's looking at me defensive as if I'm trying. I'm not at war with you. Then I'm looking in the face of quote unquote white America and they're seeing me as a threat. So I could speak to that. And then, man, there was, it was so many other points that I, that I wanted to get it that we just touched on. But I think overall to build a bit off of what Dominique was saying and what Harlan was saying is I think absolutely there are expectations that we have to draw on the line. So for me, I'm a nineties baby. When I thought about identity, because my parents split up, I looked at people like Uncle Phil. I was I was into TV. So when I watched Uncle Phil and I watched Carl Winslow and I watched Steve Hightower and I watched the Jamie Foxx show and I watched Smart Guy and Fresh Prince, like that was things that I wanted to emulate. Like those are the people I wanted to be like. And then I think the perfect example for the black man in America is Boys in the Hood. Because I realized in, in doing the healthy... Um, masculinity project this past last summer when I really sat back and we started one of the conversations I had we dissect that movie I said man some people wanted to run fast like Ricky so they could be recruited some people wanted to have the cool caddy like Doughboy some people wanted to be the fly guy like Trey I just remember thinking I wanted to be like furious I wanted to be philosophical but I could understand how each and every person based on your circumstance, based on your environment may identify with somebody different in that movie. And I think even to this day, 
that is one of the greatest examples of the experience of a black man and how depending on who you are and where you are at that stage of life where you may gravitate towards stuff steve yeah dr vibe i um you know this for a long time i, I tried to prove myself i'm i'm a, a beach volleyball coach and um you know beach volleyball is predominantly well when i was playing you know in the 80s early 90s predominantly white sport um it's international now but you know in north america it's still predominantly uh white as far as males go and um i found myself in the room the only black person in the room many times especially when it came to national programs olympic programs and it used to bother me i used to notice it and then i i realized that it only mattered if i allowed it to matter so I'll have black conversations all day long, but no one can say, they can criticize my performance and say it's because I'm black. And I think that's the, kind of the paradox is like just owning myself. And I had, to, I had to do a lot of work to be able to own my baggage and all my ugly stuff and stuff I wanna tuck away in the closet, you know, and lock it up. I, now my closet's unlocked. The ego gets to come out freely. All my stuff gets to come out freely because I'm not afraid of it. And it's not attacking me all the time. I've come to a place to where I can embrace it. It's helped me get to where I am. And then there's the other stuff that I want to celebrate. So there's this paradox that goes, the stuff I want to hide and the stuff I want to celebrate. And when I realize that it makes me whole to have both, then I can just relax. I'm a human being. So I'm not trying to prove myself anymore. I did for years. And it's only because I realize no matter what I do, I'm always going to have my critics, man. There's always going to be some hater, somebody who's undercutting me. And I'm always going to have people that just because I dare to do the thing I'm passionate about, they dare to do the thing they're passionate about. And that's what people did for me. And that's my duty. You know, I like exactly, Wayne, exactly what you said. It's my duty to show up and to contribute and be who I can be. That's people have paved this way for me. They've made it possible for me. And now I'm going to sit back and just ride on it. No, and I'm always going to have my critics. So, you know, you can't please, you can't please everyone. I'm just going to benefit the people I can benefit and everyone else. Well, they have someone else that can benefit them. It's not me. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's giving me some peace. So I'll go to Wayne next and then we'll get to LeVan. So Wayne. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Great job, uh, Steve. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Like I, like I said, I, Vibe and I were part of a group called Each One Teach One, Brother to Brother. One of the first men group I was involved in. We were helping young boys who come from, you know, 75% single mom homes. Mm -hmm. And we, we are still in touch with these boys. They're married. They have kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. And we're, we're still there mentoring. Robert, I want to I wanna applaud you. I, I'm just wondering, you know, if you're, if you're black... Your left foot's in the black community. Your, your right foot's in the Chinese community. Um, you know, if, if 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 one is hot and one is cold, are you warm, or did you pick a side, hot or cold? Um, I, I don't think I ever picked a side. You know, um, I just made peace with the fact that there were two sides, and that that was okay, and that was my definition. And whoever liked it liked it, and whoever didn't didn't. Um, so, um, you know, I embrace both sides of the equation equally. Um, so one of the things is we, we have a, we have a billionaire in Canada, Michael Lee Chin. Yeah. He's half black and he's half Chinese. He's one of the richest <laughs> top 15 richest guys in the country. And he did it through financial services and, and, and building assets and real estate. So it's interesting because Chinese and black is something that I only saw really in uh, the Caribbean. You see it in Jamaica. Yeah. You see it in Trinidad. You see it in mm -hmm. Guyana. My dad's from Trinidad. There you go. Mm -hmm. And then you see it in in uh, North America, the descendants of those um, entanglements, as Jada Pinkett would would, would say. <laughs> What's interesting about the about the relationships, the interracial relationships, in the Caribbean, is that they were they are based on socioeconomics. Okay, Chinese can marry Indian and white and light skin black if those other races are bringing 
academic, political, or economic heat. They'll allow it, even as dark as me. So if I'm a doctor and your daughter's white, well, not white, she's a super light skin Indian. Fair, fair skin, right? Fair skin. They're like, hmm, but he's a doctor. Mm, okay. Right? So when you look at classism, racism is really a disguise for classism. Mm. This is a battle between the 1% and everybody else with the distraction of racism. Understand, they, it's not that Levant or, or Harlan is a threat. It's that if they take the red pill rather than the blue pill, they will know that they're being played. And right. once they figure that out, and that's why the internet has to be managed by algorithms, so all I see is all things black or all things left wing or all things right wing, because if I can see behind the curtain, I'll know the wizard is a midget. And I'll start doing things differently and start rising up and organizing. You see, this, this screen here has uh, eight, 12 people on it with 12 different ideas, 12 different levels of intellect, 12 different... Uh, focuses 12 different uh, everything but if we all decide to come together on one subject one purpose and everyone use their individual superpowers in the role that's given to them or they select for themselves things can change like that Excellent. last point Steve is born 1964 or 63 64 I'm born in 1966 both of us during the civil rights movement. Now, I guess Robert and, and maybe Lee, you're, you're on into Terry Martindale based on this picture. He might be there too. In our lifetime, our lifetime, not our parents, not our grandma, in our lifetime, Malcolm was killed. Mm -hmm. Martin was killed. Mm -hmm. Medgar was killed. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. In our lifetime. So when people say it's ancient history, black history, it's in our lifetime. There's a beautiful video of, of a young brother he does a lot of um, kind of commentary and he talks about if you're this old you know someone in their 50s they drank at a water fountain in louisville kentucky during steve's lifetime that was colored only that's how thin how, that's how far we've come and how little we've 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 progressed in 56 years so here's what I want you guys to understand. Code switching is normal. Yeah. You understand? I had to code switch. I only had facial hair in the last three years. You know why? Because my entire career, if I had facial hair, I fit the description. So I was already six foot two and dark, 215 pounds. I can't walk into a room and have a beard. I just intimidate the pants off of every white man in the room and the white women. And it's over for me before it gets started. My name is Wayne Harris, not Juan Ye, not Jamal. <laughs> Not, not Jalen, not Kadeem, it's Wayne. So when you hear Wayne Harris before LinkedIn, you didn't know who was going to come. And you can hear in my accent, if you listen closely, you'll hear the Bajan. Yeah. But if you're not listening closely, my wife is Trini, by the way, Rob. Big up to <laughs> yeah. If you listen close, if most people will say, I speak without an accent. Yeah. So over the phone is, hey, Bob, how you doing? I'll be down in Texas next week. Okay, I'll see you in Dallas. Meet you, meet you at the airport in, in Grapevine. Cheers, bye. And I fly down there, and then they meet me, and you see their eyes. What I love about white people is their eyes are lighter color. And because they're lighter color, the pupil will pinpoint when they don't like you and dilate when they do. I didn't know that. Oh, there you go. And if, and if, they, don't, if they don't know I know that, I'm like, hey, how you doing? And I'm watching their pupils. It's, it's, it's reflex. They can't control it. They can't once control. I see the pinpoint, I know there's no deal for me. I already know you're a Klansman. You don't know that I know. And I still mm -hmm. treat you as if I don't know anything. So right. understand a couple of things. One, history is recent. Two, approval addiction is the biggest addiction black people suffer from today. Mm -hmm. Which is why broke people have gold chains and big rims on a 12-year-old Toyota. It doesn't make any sense. It's approval addiction. Low identity, look at your friends, look at your colleagues, look at who you associate with, and trust me, your income is plus or minus $10,000 of theirs, mm -hmm. and your identity is right where theirs is. The only way we change our identity to level up is if we find people who are at the next level, and they're willing to take us with them. 
So Steve, if you're at 100 degrees and I'm at 75 degrees, I hang with you, I get to 85. I won't get to 100. But if I go back with my old, my old boys, I'm going right back down to 75 because that's where they like me and that's where I feel most comfortable and nothing right. happens in your comfort zone. All right. LeVance, come oh, on in. Well said. Listen, firstly, I just want to I just want to say, Mr. Wayne Harris, you're dropping some knowledge over here, man. Listen, you, you blessed me so much just you know by the things that you just said. And um, I, uh, they resonate with me so deeply, and I believe in the same way. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Dr. Vibe, appreciate being on the show. You know, I came in late, just finishing up another meeting. But um, could you do me a favor and just orient me to 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 the question? I just want to make sure that I'm answering it right and providing value here. I think what we're talking about is are you have are you having to prove yourself as a black man? Like we gave some examples of in different environments. And sometimes we have to prove ourselves when it's around people that look like us. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Man, that, that's that, you know, when you ask that question, it, my mind is going to so many, so many different areas and places of my life where I've had to do that. And I think more recently here, um, currently I work for a, for a company where out of 113, 115 salespeople, um, I'm the only black person in the department, literally only black person. And you could tell I have a bit of an accent as well, but uh, I'm American for those of you, you know, my accent betrays me. Uh, but anyway, uh, out of 113, 115 people, I'm the only black person in, in the, you know, in our sales, in our sales department. And uh, so uh, when you talk about code switching, you know, it's, it's, um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm speaking freely, a little bit more freely now because of the, you know, the people who are present on this call. But when I'm at work, when I'm in that environment, um, I have to speak a certain way. I have to look a certain way and I have to walk a certain way. And the, and the reason why I do that is to make sure that my director, uh, constituents, uh, leadership feel comfortable because they're generally uh, white male. And when I say feel comfortable, you can hear that you can hear the baritone in my voice. If I sit up, you can see my stature. I played football in college, so I'm not a small man. And um, and and you can see the look in my eyes. This this isn't me trying to put on a show. I'm kind of my eyes are just intense. That's just how I am. You know? But um, so I, I I I consciously try to smile. I consciously try to walk in a way that isn't uh, like I'm walking down the street where I'm from in Flint, Michigan. Um, and I do that again to make people feel safe. Now, why would I want to do that? Because in, in some cases, the promotion can be on the line. Um, um, in some cases, you know, uh, you know, the opportunity to be mentor can be on the line. And the reality is, in my situation, that has been the case. But I'm the type of person where I, I will not forsake who I am to fit into anybody's circle or bubble. Um, I don't know how I, how, I, how, I, how I gathered that. Maybe it's just the, you know, the surety that I have in my own identity. But over, I, I'm just, I've, I, you know what? I know exactly what happened throughout my life as I was growing up and I was going through these, you know, playing sports, you know, having white coaches and doing different things and being mentored and coached by white men. I figured that I needed to leave a little bit of my blackness alone. I mean, my, my bit of my blackness back. So when I was playing sports, nope, my, my hair was cut low. You can see I've got dreads now. It's a story behind that. But um, I think at the age of 24, I decided that I was not going to, that I was going to be happy. Mm. That's what happened. I decided, I said, you know what? I'm going to be happy and I'm going to wear an earring in my ear. I'm going to grow my hair. Um, I'm going to put zigzags in my hair, right? Um, I'm going to grow my beard a bit and I'm going to walk, you know, you know, in, in that times, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to walk the way that I want to walk. And, uh, and that's what I did. I made that decision and in some ways, you know, I can't measure this, but in some ways, maybe it did cost me a bit. But what it didn't cost me was my personal integrity and my and my self confidence and who I who I who I believe that I am. I didn't have to lose myself. So, growing up being a black man, you know, there 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 are times when I have you know I've I felt that I've had to change and just to fit in and you know like for example you know the men that I work with today predominantly white they all play golf, you know. I had to learn how to play golf just so that I could have a conversation so I could, so I could get to a, uh, how do you call it? So I could have some commonality with these men outside of just work so that I can learn how to talk their lingo and learn how to influence in that space for, for my, for my self-preservation in that environment. But 
I have to be honest with you. It has been a painstaking process and it is, it has impacted me for the last five years. It's, 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 you know, mentally. And um, I think I'm at the point right now where I've, uh, I've not only realized it, but now I'm doing something about it. And, and uh, it's been a tough go, but I've learned a lot about myself in that process. And I think the man that I'm becoming today, the path that I'm on today, uh, you know, to your point, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wayne Harris, talking about the people that you're hanging around, the influences, the, you know, the type of income, you, you know, you talked about your thermostat being one way and being the other and being comfortable to thing like that. I'm on the path to, to, to constantly increase my thermostat, to constantly get this thing on fire, to keep it on fire. And I think, you know, for those of you who may be watching this right now, you know, I think some of the ways that you could think a couple of different ways that you can actually increase your stomach, your stomach stat. Uh, Mr. Wayne Harris said it. One, it's about your, it's, it's the people that you hang around. It's really your associations. One of those are the people that you hang around. You know, if, the, if, if that, if you're at a 75 minute or 65, listen, you're going to, you're going to reduce that thermostat because that's naturally what happens. If they're at an 85 or, or 95, like, you know, Mr. Wayne Harris said, you're going to improve your thermostat. It's going to go up a bit. So that's one we can do by your association, the people you hang around. Another way that you can do it is by associating with people through books. You know, you got to read some books. You know, you, you, you can read the book, you know, by uh, the first person that came to my mind is Bill Gates. But, you know, some other black authors out there who, who great biographies, reading books, understanding these people's stories, associating with, the, associating with these different stories uh, will help you raise your thermostat as well. And that's one of the things that I've become on over the last few years as an avid reader as well. Uh, so I'm a complete here because I could continue to ramble on. But uh, just, I guess, in a bit of a nutshell, that's, that's my story. That's good stuff. Um, we don't got a lot of time left. <laughs> we, but So what I'm going to do is for the men that are in men's teams, there's a question here. Oh, Wayne's got something. He's putting up a book. He's trying to put up a book. What got you here won't get you there. Good book. Very good book. Uh, I will maybe put up a book before the end, but I want to keep the conversation conversation flow going. So the men that are in men's teams right now, there's a question here from Facebook. What's your experience with being in men's teams as a black man? This person is saying, I find there's not a lot of black men in circles. Who would like to take that one on? I've been on a men's team for almost 30 years. And I think that's true. I mean, I think that I don't know why that is, but um that that has been my experience i mean i've been you know in, in groups with literally you know thousands of men and the, the percentage of black men and in at least within these kinds of men's groups i have not uh, is very low it's very very almost infinitesimal so I'm, I'm not sure what the what the reason is for that though I think, and I think it's a powerful environment. It's it served me well to define myself from my own circumstances among men as a man, simply. Um, and I think it's I think it's a powerful and important place for men to have associations with groups of men, i.e., this call. The benefits of that are are you know they're almost incalculable. So um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd like to hear what any any of you others have an opinion on that. I, I definitely have an opinion on that. The um, I'm in two teams currently. One is um, my men's team, Sterling Institute of Relationship, and um, the you second went to team Sterling Institute with Sterling Institute. You, you yes. did the weekend, and I, that's what I did too. Yeah, and um, so that's that's my team, and I've you know since 2013 I've been on a, a men's team with Sterling Institute, and we started. Um, just this past year, the Black Diamond Circle. Um, now, Mr. Dotson is second in our tribe, in our, in our Sterling uh, tribe. Um, and he's also in the Black Diamond Circle. And Mr. McKinney and Mr. Dominique, they joined the Black Diamond Circle. So that's their, their first circle um, with the with Circle Up um, project. So for me, it, this is something that's baffled me, but I know it from beach volleyball. You know, it's not part of the lifestyle. It's word yeah. of mouth. It's, um, there might be some stigma about what you're doing. And with the Black Diamond Circle, it's a, the Black Diamond Circle 
is a group of men of color, black men. It was created that way for a reason. There is a black conversation that we need to be able to have and we need to be able to have it openly. And it's black men with black men. There's a relationship that we have, a relationship of trust, a relationship where we support each other's success. No competition, no judgment. It's, it's a unique situation. And it was really important that it be a group of black men uh, like I said, I'm still in my other team and um, having to think about it, I think I am the only black man in my team, <laughs> in, my, in my Sterling team. Um, you know, Mr. McKendy is the captain. He's just taking over captain um, for the Black Diamond Circle. And it was really his vision. There were two men, him and another man, uh, David Shook, who really brought this to me and brought it to the circle up to have this vision to serve these men, these black men in Buffalo. So I'd actually like to hear uh, you speak, and Mr. Dodson, you've been in you've been in men's teams as well, uh, both Sterling and, and the Black Diamond Circle. Well, Mr. McKendy, um, you're the captain of this team now, and this was part of your vision to bring this to the men in Buffalo originally, and to have it be part of the community. So, what's your experience? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Anderson. For me, the Black Diamond Circle stands alone when it comes to any other experience within the realms of just black men. I saw someone mention in the chat ego. From my personal experience, I've seen it, whether it be from a religious aspect, whether it be in the athletic sphere, whether it be in the entertainment industry, <laughs> I've seen ego be a plague where at some point, there's always that breaking point where my experience with the Black Diamond Circle is every man in his own right has a sphere of influence and plays a vital role, whether it's from an accountability aspect, whether it's from a task, whether it's from an idea point, whether it's from just voicing a, an opinion that maybe everyone else didn't think about or hasn't seen before. I think it, it like I said, it stands alone in my experience as, as a, not only a safe space, but a necessary growth environment. And um, like you said, it's, it's so necessary. And in the modern era, I don't know, which this came to my mind though, I don't know if it would have been the same if we weren't in this current predicament either, because Zoom did offer a different opportunity where men from different areas could connect, where it wasn't sitting in the same space because emotions and egos and energy can be transferred when you're in the same room that I think can be a plague and can harm the conversation. So one of the blessings that we have through everything that's going on is having Zoom and having that space where, like I said, each man has his moment and each man has a moment where they help another man up. And uh, Black Diamond Circle is exactly what it is. It's, it's a circle of diamonds. If I could jump in just really quickly as well, um, and maybe provide, you know, um, an equal another perspective as well is that I think to, first of all, it's, it's I think it's an anomaly to have a circle like this around black men who are actually pushing to you know to become great at whatever they want to become great at and not tear each other down. Um, I haven't been a part of these circles in the past, so this has definitely been a blessing for me. But I think what's unique about this circle as well is that we can let our hair down, right? And, and what I mean by that is we can speak plain. Yeah, you know, some of you men, hey, come on, you know, you got some imaginary hair there. We just can't see it. <laughs> but we can, but we, we we can we can let it down, right? There, there's there's a way that we can speak plainly without having to think about someone else's feelings, without having to think about um, am I being politically correct or not? You know, while being black. So we can, we can, like I said, let our hair down. And I think being able to speak freely like that, it, 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 it's, it's freeing. And, uh, and, 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 it, and it supports, it's, it, I can say for myself, it supports me because it just makes me feel better. It's gonna sound weird. It maybe sound crazy. 
it makes me feel better in my blackness if that if that makes sense i don't know if that if that if that sounds crazy but it actually does it makes me feel better in my blackness because i'm around black men who have experienced and probably will experience if they haven't some of the same things that i've experienced as well i'm going to complete there no problem harlan Yeah, um, to kind of touch on, on to Doxon's point um, in regards to making, it does make you feel like a better black man. You know, as a young man, it's, for me personally, it's beautiful to see, you know, like-minded individuals of all ages. You know, we have people in there who's in the mid to late 20s, people who's in their early 30s, 40s, uh, 50, um, and 60, I believe, too. Um, and they all come with different perspectives of life, right? So whether it's the, the topic of women and how women are projected, whether it's how you carry yourself as an African-American man or a black man, to say, in a workspace, it's always a teachable moment uh, um, and an, an enlightenment moment as well. And like McKinley said, it's a, safe, it's a safe haven. It's a safe place, you know? Like Dawson said as well, you get out. I literally let my hair down <laughs> and I go, when I'm in there, you know, I feel comfortable. I can, I can let it out. I can actually speak how I want to speak. I don't have to sugarcoat anything. And we hold each other accountable. You know, one, one of the things that we, we typically say, you know, we, we, we're trying to be honorable, you know, we're trying to be the man that we see yourself with, you know? So each, each, every one of the individuals that's in there are trying to help each other out, help that man become the man that they envision. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Nice. Well, our time is running short. So what I'm going to do is uh, I would like each individual from the team who's in a circle to give their closing words. But first, if there's anyone that is not in a circle that would like to give some closing thoughts, and I would like you to give this message to Black men. So what is your message to Black men? So first of all, if there are any people on the call that are not in a circle, if there's something you want to share, please speak now and then we'll go down the line for, for the gentlemen that are in a circle. So Wayne, do you have anything you want to share? I, I'm sure you would. Yeah, listen, I, 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 I don't want to make it sound like we haven't moved the chains Football analogy, not a slavery analogy. Good double analogy there. <laughs> double entendre. Yeah. Uh, I I don't want to make it feel that we haven't moved the chains because when I look at Levance, I'm checking you guys out on LinkedIn. I'm adding you guys on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm seeing where you are and what you're doing. This was impossible 50 years ago. What he yep. is doing was impossible 50 years ago. What Steve was doing was impossible 50 years ago. You understand? So I have a son. Some of you may have sons and daughters. I have a son and a daughter. And my mission is simple. Learn and teach so that their path is not as hard as Steve's and mine and Vibes and the others of us in our 50s. So the ones in the 30s, we, you, you, I don't know if some of you are too young to remember roller derby. But roller derby, you used to join hands and you used to whip the last person forward. Our job as men on this panel is to roller derby and grab Levance and grab Harlan and whip him forward, knowing that when he gets forward, he will whip someone else forward. It doesn't have to be me. I'm not paying, I'm not looking for payback. I'm looking for you to pay it forward. So what I'm doing now is I'm paying for it. And you don't have to have any stature or money or position. You just have to have the mindset that you want to whip people forward. So I'm, I'm ready to join a circle that wants to move forward. I'm not looking for gentlemen of the same temperature. I will t I, I'll accept people who are of a lower temperature, but I definitely want to meet people who are of a higher temperature because I'm looking to level up, not level off. Well said, Wayne. Anyone else who's not in a circle who has something to share, then we'll get. Okay, who would like to go first? from the, the team. I'm not gonna let it be too quiet too long, you know? Uh, <laughs> I, I, thought they'd let, I thought they'd let you go last, but they want you, you to know, go first. You think? I was trying to, really? you, you, see, you see, I waited a moment, right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to wait, yeah. but uh, it's too much to be said. You know, 
I got to yeah. I got to go back and look at the the tape of this. Wayne, you got so many quotables and things I have to put into my uh, mindset here. I really appreciate uh, and every man is, is speaking here. You know, it's wisdom. The um, you know, Doctor uh, Wayne Farrell uh, said something that shook me uh, a while ago. Um, he said that men are um, men are thought of as um, expendable. It shook me. It absolutely shook me because it was it, as soon as he said it, I recognized it as true. You know, whether we go off to war or whether we get up and go off to work all day and we don't spend any time with our families and we're thinking about protecting and providing and our kids hate us because we're not there to raise them and all this sort of stuff. You know, men, men are looked at to be expendable. And the worst part about it is we men keep this going as much as anyone else. We, we look at each other and like, if you don't go out, if you're not fighting a war, you know, what do you mean you wanna stay home and raise your kids? What do you, you know, what kind of man are you? So remapping what manhood is. Masculinity is not macho. You know, don't be, don't make decisions with your feelings, but have feelings. You're a human being. How are you gonna express those in a healthy way and not let them drive you into the ground with your decision making? There's all sorts of things. So it's it's really about the mindset. That's what I'm looking for. And that's what the Black Diamond Circle, my Sterling team is the same thing. It's a whole different experience and challenge with, with the team that I'm with where I'm the only black man on the team. I get so much value out of that. What these other men have said, I don't have another experience like the Black Diamond Circle, a group of black men who wanna support the success of other black men. That's the thing I wanna create. And what these men are creating is a new way of being as a, as a black man, as a man, I want to remap the way that we think of ourselves and the way society thinks of us. As a, and there's a conversation inside the conversation. I'm a black man as well. So I got to work on two parts. Me as a man, me as a black man, especially in North America, where the systems are set up not to support me. So how do I reinvent myself so that I, I don't bring along all this baggage and give it to my 12 year old son. So he's living the same slavery, colonized crap that I'm living because it's part of my implicit biases that I'm not even aware of. So that's that's the thing, how we change our thinking and how we how we work together collectively to, to rise up and, and support each other instead of competing with each other and thinking that I'm gonna be the only one there. Like I just like to, um, you know, jump on that too. Um, I think what you said about vulnerability is a critical element in that too. I think, um, I think being learning to be able to learning the power of vulnerability. I put in the title of that book into the chat um, um, by Brene Brown, the power of vulnerability. And that to me was a critical uh, element in me being able to access my power and my ability to be vulnerable with myself and with others. And I think that that's an important dynamic that's not really built into masculine culture in general. But um, so I think that that's, that's an important part of the dynamic and, and having a circle of men that you trust in your life. Um, I, mean, I did the, the Sterling Men's Weekend in eight, 86 and I've been on a men's team ever since, meeting once a week since then. Wow. And it's been the most powerful and unifying and foundational element of my masculinity and, and my development as a man and maintaining the standards of a man. Uh, so I think don't do it by yourself is what I would say. If you're not part of a team in some way, get on a team. So that would be my, my simple my simple, uh, not, it's not a solution, but my simple foundation for, for moving forward as a man is to have other men that you trust in your life. Like, like some of the great men on this call, I wanna, I'm honored to be here and I honor all you men for being here and sharing. So thank you. And then there were three. 
They're all in the same row too on my screen. So I'll jump okay. in here really quickly. So I'll say this. Um, when you, I didn't know how much I needed men in my life. For a very long time, I was a loner. I was okay with doing things by myself. And to be quite honest with you, I was somewhat successful. But the reality is, is that you can be somewhat successful as a loner, but you will never become your best self alone. Because there's, you, you don't have a 360 degree perspective to be able to see all your blind spots. And other people will help you see that. So I want to leave with this for those men who may be entertaining joining a circle. Um, men need men. You may feel a ways about that, especially if growing up, um, the way men presented themselves to you, you know, it, it was you know, you have a adverse reaction to men or you don't like authority, whatever it may be. Maybe you don't, you didn't trust men growing up because of things that happened to you. But regardless of that point, not dismissing it because it's important, but men need men. Absolutely no question about it. And then to take it a step further, black men need black men. No doubt about it. I'm a complete there. And then there were two. Do I have to flip a coin? <laughs> um, I'm, I'll go, I'll go right. ahead real quick. Um, I'm just going to leave off with two things. The first thing is there are 7.8 billion people on the planet. There's only one you, and we all play a role in the history of our world. So why not live it with honor? And then my last question that I pose to everyone, this is my philosophy, it is... Everyone needs a hero. Why can't it be you? I wonder who's last. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, for me, I'll, I'll just say this uh, to black men. Um, you know, my my first time joining the circle, um, I was a little bit closed minded. Uh, and I wasn't authentic and I came in and the men in there they sniffed me out <laughs> yeah that's what I love about it <laughs> <laughs> no hiding out from men yeah they sniffed me out and chewed me out and and, and made me realize that you know I have to come as I am and, and be real um so what I tell these guys you know who are who are looking to join um be open um take accountability and be authentic, you know. Um, someone said it earlier, men need men, you know. So I know, I know my early upbringings, I didn't trust men. But this uh, this circle made me actually trust men. And I didn't really, if it wasn't for them, I, I wouldn't be the man I'm becoming today. Received. Oh. Received. Well, um, as we close off this conversation, I'm just gonna end up with a few quick things. If there are black men out there that want to find out more about the circle that the, some of these black men are involved with, contactlevancedotson at gmail.com. That is the best place to go to, to catch that. And I hope that someone who's watching this either live on the replay does that. Um, in regards to circles, I am not part of a circle myself, but I know a lot of men. There are men in this screen who are part of a circle, and I have benefited by knowing them and allowing them to meet better and also calling me out. And a few last things I'm going to end off on. Here's a quote for Black men out there. Boys make excuses, men take responsibility. And I strongly urge, especially getting involved in a circle, every man out there, and I say this over and over again, especially black men, you need to have two or three black men that know everything good about you and everything bad about you. And you will certainly get that in a circle. And if you don't know what that experience is like, I hope that when something not good happens, you have someone, another black man or black men there with you, especially one from the circle. 
And the last thing I'm going to finish off with before we sign off, a little quick story. My dad is still alive. He is 83 years old. Last summer, we went and celebrated, it was before the pandemic, we went to celebrate his best friend's 85th birthday. Two things happened there that I hope that each black man and each person on the screen, regardless of color, race, or sex experiences. At the end of the night, they asked people to make speeches. My dad got up there, of course, being a Jamaican man and a teacher for 38 years, you know he's gonna grab the mic first, right? First thing he said was, I know I've known this man longer than any other person, even his wife. And then he closed off saying, this man has been my best friend for 70 years. So my message, especially to the black men on this call or watching the replay, I hope you live that long and I hope that you can say that same sort of statement. I know that I've known Wayne Harris for at least 30 years plus. He shakes his head going, I don't know how, but, <laughs> but <laughs> right. And one last thing I'm gonna encourage, um, Wayne put up a book. I'm gonna put, put up a book that I would suggest every black man read called Black Men Obsolete, Single and Dangerous. This book was written in 1990. It is still very relevant today. If anyone needs information on it, you can contact me. Just look up Dr. Vibe on the internet and you'll find a hold. I'd like to thank every black man that was on this call, every person that was on this call. And the, sad, the good thing is we gotta do a part two, gentlemen. Absolutely. We have to do a part two. And I think sooner rather than later, so myself, Robert, Lee, Terry, and Michelle, who's not here, we're part of the programming committee. We are certainly gonna take that because I think we need to have this conversation on a more regular basis. That's just me. I would like to say, if you wanna find out more about men and masculinity, go to the website, www.menandmasculinity.com. And finally, to everybody out there, remember to give yourselves grace. Thanks for watching. And as we say in Jamaica, walk good. Good night, everybody. <laughs>